it's a great pleasure uh, to be with you this this evening in particular. Um, I know the weather is excellent outside, so you could be doing a million and one things. So it's really great that you could spend time with me. So, and I also know when central banks stopped cutting interest rates and hiking interest rates, apparently we became unlikable. So I'm, I'm really great, grateful that you could invite me here this spring evening. Today I'm going to be talking to you about the Saab's monetary policy response to the worst global inflation surge in decades, what we did, why we did it, and where we go from here. So please just join me. I'm going to simplify things. I'm not going to go into full-on economics, but I thought it would be useful for us to reflect on, on that. I've got some slides, uh, and I thought the slide behind me would, would pique your, your interest. I'll tell you in a little while why I've put that, that slide uh, behind me. So let me start with the year 2021. We were stumbling out of COVID. The global economy was very weak, but inflation pressures were starting to build up. And during the COVID cycle, central banks played a significant role in providing stimulus to the economy. Um, in 2021, there was still an abundance of stimulus in the system, especially in rich economies. But during this time, food and fuel prices were rising and global supply chain problems began to escalate. In fact, before I came here, Morris and I were having this conversation around the big lessons from COVID and how the multiple lockdowns across economies affected things around the world. Um, so we were all sitting in our homes. We couldn't go anywhere. We all needed new TVs. We were expanding. We were buying extra food. But during this time, there was no manufacturing in some key economies because they had extended lockdowns. The shipping lines were not operating optimally. And all of those things fed into the supply side um, constraints that what we were demanding was not being met by sufficient supply. And so we saw these problems starting to show themselves. In 2022, in early 2022, I'm sure you were all surprised by the Russia-Ukraine war in the same way that we were as a central bank. So please forgive me, I'm going to do this. Um, and even now, actually, revisiting some key numbers, it's startling how quickly costs began to rise. If you've got a piece of paper, you can jot down some of these. I'm going to be trolling through some numbers very quickly. So oil prices went from $50 a barrel at the start of 2021 to $80 a barrel by the end of that year. By the middle of 2022, oil prices were at $120 a barrel. And the UN Food and Agriculture Organization's food index climbed 18% from the start to the end of 2021, and another 16% by June 2022. And inflation in the United States went from 1.4% at the start of 2021 to 7.2% at the end of that year, and almost 9% by the middle of 2022. These conditions were both alarming and difficult, particularly because we had just emerged from the COVID pandemic. And metaphorically, it felt like we'd just been driving along and we came around a corner and went into a skit. That's literally what, what it felt like. And in multiple central banking conversations, we were having this debate about whether this inflation is transitory or permanent. Now, if you're driving a car and start skidding, there are two things you're supposed to do. The most obvious one is not to panic. The other is to steer into the skid 
Now, I've been fortunate enough that this has not happened to me and I keep running through it in my mind. But this is hard advice to follow because a skidding car is scary, so it's easy to panic. And steering into the skid is also counterintuitive. It doesn't go with what your instinct is telling you to do. And many drivers try to steer sharply in the opposite direction. But then the wheels don't regain traction and you lose control of the car. And the reptilian part of our brains is generally not good in a crisis because it's telling us to follow our, our instincts. Now, you might be wondering what, what this has to do with, with central banking, but I think it's quite an apt analogy, hence the picture that I, I have uh, behind me. The answer is that when you hit with big inflation shocks, the same big rules apply. You must not panic, and your proper reaction function, counterintuitively, is to raise interest rates. Now, the picture behind me is a picture of a meteor that we see coming to hit Earth. And, and I use this as part of this metaphor because a picture exactly like this was put out uh, in the world of astrology. Now, when you see this picture, you're thinking, oh my goodness, we're going to be hit. But there are some important pieces of information that you will miss if you're not an astrologist. It's the size of the asteroid there. It is the path it is likely to follow. And you might discover it's smaller than it looks on, on the picture. Uh, and these are the things that we have to learn as, as central bankers. An important part of our knowledge base and the instincts that one gains as a central banker are about getting the reaction right. And it's the same as an experienced driver knowing what to do in a skid, whereas a novice is likely to go off the road and crash. Unfortunately, much of what informs the decisions that we take as central banks is not fully visible at the time when initial decisions are made to hike interest rates. And as a result, much of the public discussion at the onset of this inflation cycle took the form of panic and mixed with insistence that there is no point in raising interest rates to fight inflation that is coming from supply side shocks. But there is a point to every central bank reaction function. So as we've learned from painful experiences, if you ignore big shocks, they don't go away and they grow and they persist. So this process typically entails three steps. In the first step, you get the initial shock. And this quickly shows up in the relevant parts of the inflation basket. In this instance, we can use fuel as an example. In the second step, the shock broadens to other goods prices that reset often, which were affected by the supply shock. In this instance, fuel is an important part of transport costs, uh, and we have transportation of many other goods. So you start to see that effect. So a fuel shock also raises other prices. There is a third step, and this third step is when slow-moving prices start to adjust. Typically, services where prices are reset every 12 months, like rental agreements, like wage agreements. So that initial fuel shock that was supposed to be transitory and be with us for a short time, it can start to feed into other price setting. And the problem for central banks is really not, not step one. We don't have the tools to stop prices from going up. We can't stop price shocks when they come through. The job is really about managing steps two and three. What happens when that initial shock starts to feed into, uh, into the, the rest of the prices in the economy? So code for this in central banking, when we talk about second round effects, this is what we are generally referring to. 
So let's apply this framework to South Africa and I'll illustrate and I'll show you some nice pictures about what, what happened to inflation. So at the start of 2021, you'll see that we had headline inflation and that's the black line on this chart. We had headline inflation at 3.2%, which is near the bottom of our inflation target range. We also had the red line, which is core inflation at 3.3%. As food, as the food and fuel price shocks came in, you start to see what happens to, um, to headline inflation. It starts to go above the midpoint of the inflation target range. Uh, and by November 2021, when we started hiking up interest rates as, as the central bank, headline inflation was sitting at 5.5%. Core inflation at this point still hasn't moved. It's still at 3.3%. And this was the point at which people were saying, hey, you're doing the wrong thing. Uh, and we were hearing the complaints that there's no points in, in dealing with a supply uh, side shock. And at this point, we were still at step one. By the middle of 2022, headline inflation was at 7.4%. You'll see on the chart, hopefully I get my pointer right. Um, okay, I can't get that right. But if you look at that peak in July 2022, that was the point at which headline inflation peaked. That was 7.8% at that time. Core inflation was at 4.4% at this point. But within core inflation, other things were happening. So we break down core inflation into two different types of inflation. So there's services, which are the prices that I highlight that generally uh, reset every 12 months, most of them. And then we've got core goods. And you can see that the services line and the core goods line are moving very differently. So in the middle of uh, 2022, core goods inflation was at 5.1%. Services inflation was at 3.9% at that time. By the end of the year, headline inflation was a bit lower. It was back to 7.2%. But core inflation at that point in aggregate was up to 4.9%. And much of this acceleration was because of that dynamic that I was highlighting earlier, which is what happened to goods prices post COVID. You had the shipping lines not sending out goods, you had shortages on the production line. And so we saw core goods prices also reaching the inflation target. They were above 6%. And this was step two for us. So far this year, headline inflation has slowed significantly and it was about 4.8% in August. But in September, we had a new fuel price uh, pressure and we saw headline inflation jump back up to 5.4%. Core hasn't moved uh, by as much, so it's, we think it has stopped up uh, around April this year, and it's currently it's been hovering uh, between 5% and 4.5%. So it was 5.3% in April, and in September we're sitting at 4.5%. So we could probably say that we completed step three for us as a central bank by the first half of this year, where we think that the shocks uh, appear to have reached the peak effects on the core good side. But many risks remain on, on the horizon. Now imagine a counterfactual where we hadn't hiked interest rates. And I know I'm asking for a lot, so I'm asking you to take off your debtor's hat, I'm asking you to take off your saver's hat, and let's just talk uh, around this academic exercise here, because I know we all have very strong views depending on where we sit on, on the spectrum. Now, the first problem, if we had done nothing as a central bank, would be that core inflation would have ended up rising quite markedly. Now, 
this is a debatable fact. You might get another school of thought where people say, actually, maybe this would have been self-correcting. Saab, we don't need you. Uh, there are self-correcting mechanisms in the market. Well, we don't think in that way as a central bank. We have to have a reaction function. And both services and, and core goods certainly got above the midpoint of, of the inflation target. And it's, that clearly tells us that what we saw in 2021 when we started hiking rates was not transitory. In a no response scenario, we could have wasted 12 months before we started to rein in interest rates and in to rein in inflation um, and when it actually wasn't, wasn't temporary. The second problem would have been that in falling behind the curve, our interest rates setting would have made the problem a lot worse. Now, let me explain. In monetary policy, what matters is not just the nominal rate that the governor announces on the Thursday of the NPC. The critical thing in monetary policy is the policy rate adjusted for inflation. Now, when you are a saver, you will understand this concept very well because you are preserving, actively preserving the value of your money. So what is happening to interest rates and what is happening to inflation are simultaneously important for savers. And this is the tool that does the work. If you keep nominal rates unchanged, when inflation rises, you are making monetary policy looser because the real rates are lower and therefore you're falling behind the curve. But if you're a saver, it also means that the interest rates are not compensating you enough for the erosion of the value of your money. And, and that's, that's the more important issue to keep in mind. And this is where monetary policy makers can really get into, into trouble. It's very tempting to say you have a balanced approach, the economy is not doing very well, uh, and you'll raise interest rates just a little bit. But if interest rates never get above the inflation rate, policy is loose and there is no reason for the underlying inflation to stabilize. And as I highlighted earlier, savers also get an erosion of, of, of their savings. And in these circumstances, people will even start complaining that there's something wrong with economic theory because uh, rate increases are not lowering inflation, but it's simply because you're not doing enough. And this often happens when countries lose control of inflation. And it has happened again in this crisis where we had large advanced economies that were behind the curve. Uh, but, but lower interest rates don't lower inflation. I think that has been proven. Now, the good news is that there are many well-run central banks in the world, and, and most of us are, are able to, to rein in inflation. Among emer emerging markets, we've all had bad experiences with inflation, so we saw this coming a mile away. And in a way, it, it was very clear that emerging markets had something to be teaching the advanced economies in terms of, of managing uh, inflation cycles. Unfortunately, in some advanced economies, the monetary response to inflation was not timely. This is understandable because they had had multiple years in which inflation was very low in these countries but it was an error and they themselves have admitted that this was an error. That said, what distinguishes well-run organizations isn't avoiding the mistakes, it's about how they correct from, um, from the mistakes. And everyone makes mistakes. Therefore, there has been this major catch-up that we have seen among emerging, um, among advanced economies, central banks. And in recent months, since they have been acting, we are seeing their inflation starting uh, to normalize. So we really don't see ourselves going back to the 1970s period of double-digit global level inflation at this point in time. 
For South Africa, my sense is that we have reacted correctly to the skit. I know different people are not happy, uh, but, but we have avoided the panic and we are recovering control. Based on information currently available, the policy stance is probably adequate to stabilize inflation at 4.5%. Now, when we do the Q&A, I'm very happy to engage with you on why we think as a central bank having inflation at 4.5% is good for all of us. But while many in the public domain are trying to get us to say the hiking cycle is over, as I said, there are too many risks in the horizon for us to pronounce on it. And we have seen recent price pressures, mainly in fuel, but also on the food side. Load shedding is a factor that has affected what, what is happening to, um, to inflation here at home. If any of you have gone to purchase eggs, you know that there's an outbreak of the avian flu, and that has had significant impacts on, on the prices that, that we've seen. And I'd already mentioned the jump between the August and the September headline inflation numbers. So it's important here that I reiterate that as the Saab, we are committed to containing inflation. We're not committed to any particular interest rate path. The first area that we look at is what's happening to inflation. Now, in the public discussion, we seem to be past the point where we call it crazy. I think that is good. And the data is continually vindicating our policy stance. But we still have a very active conversation in South Africa about growth, a very active conversation about employment, and whether monetary policy should not be helping in, in this regard. There's even an argument that advanced economies, rather than emerging markets, did the right thing during the crisis because they only started raising interest rates when unemployment fell uh, below um, certain levels and they have lower unemployment rates than we got. This, in this story, monetary policy is good because it is raising rates only when the economy is running hot and where inflation is being driven by demand. Unfortunately, we can't apply the same lens to, uh, to the South African context. So one big problem that we have is that you can't do a clean split. You can't slice inflation up and say, this is the supply component and this is the demand component and only target the demand uh, side. The governor often has this analogy that the snake has come into the room. Do we first deal with the snake or do we ask the question of, did it come through the window? Did it come through the door and who left the window or the door open? Or do we deal with the snake in the room? So as I've outlined earlier, inflation can spread from a supply shock to the rest of the inflation basket without any clear contribution from the demand side. And this works through what economists call the expectations channel. So where we as individuals learn about inflation and we start to raise our own prices and our wage demands in response to that. Uh, and that means you can get high inflation without strong demand. And there are many examples of this and some uh, going back to the 1970s. And the solution is to manage the inflation rate that people expect. If you look at the BR survey of inflation expectations, you can see it firmly going up. It looks like it is stabilizing, but it is still, it has still been above the inflation target, the upper end of, of the inflation target range. The other problem um, with trying to target demand in South Africa is that it's unclear where we are in the business cycle. Uh, this is an economy that behaves like it's overheating when actually it's not. We have an unemployment of 30%, over 30%. We have growth of under 1%, but at the same time, we have elevated inflation. And the current account deficit is approaching 3% of GDP. 
that means we are using up all of our local savings. And we are busy borrowing and importing from the rest of the world. However, on our side, there are these infrastructure underpinnings, uh, like electricity, like rail, that are posing binding constraints on output. So when we look at what is our potential growth rate of the country, it's actually very low. Because firstly, electricity will prevent you from producing as much as you would like to. And then on the transnet side, you have a further barrier, meaning you can't transport your goods uh, to the rest of, of the world. And all of this behaves like what would happen if you had an overheating economy. You'd be utilizing your full capacity and your, your, your infrastructure would not be able to take on more. So we have the same constraints. In the Saab's modeling work, we attempt to estimate what we call an output gap, which is the difference between what the economy can produce at full demand and what it's actually producing. That current estimate is currently a fraction from zero. So there is no output gap in this country. And, and that is a big challenge for the central bank in that you have the same dynamic that you would have within an economy where demand was so elevated, but actually it's not. And it affects the, the demand reaction of the central bank. So our real tragedy as a country is not just low demand, it's the slow uh, use of human talent. It is this waste of human talent and this loss of welfare that is caused by having the in inefficiencies in the system and the inefficient use of scarce savings and the lack of urgency in implementing some of these uh, growth positive reforms. And all of these factors are outside the control of the central bank. So let me conclude, I've said a lot. I hope I've given you food for thought to ask questions as we engage this evening. The Saab takes its inflation target uh, very seriously. In late 2021, we saw danger coming and we started raising rates. Uh, and now we're seeing the fruits of, this, uh, of these efforts and we're seeing inflation starting to stabilize. In stabilizing, inflation came at a price. We're well aware of this. But the price would have been a lot higher had we failed to resolve inflation timelessly. And I recognize that rate hikes have made us unlikable, but I think South Africans also appreciate resolute actions that get results. Uh, so let me end there. Thank you very much uh, for, for your attention.